All right, one tie-in issue left, and then we're done with DC's Absolute Power event. The second one of these was much better than the first, so let's see if that trend continues. Green Lantern number 15 is written by Jeremy Adams with pencils by Fernando Passarin, inks by Eau Claire Albert, colors by Romulo Fajardo Jr., and letters by Dave Sharp. The title of this issue is Dogfight. It's been a little while since the last time we had a Green Lantern Flash team up, so here we go. <laughs> Although this time the Flash is Wally West. He lost his speed to one of Waller's Amazo robots during Absolute Power, so Superman hooked him up with a cool hover bike and a costume to go with it. In case you're wondering, Barry still has his powers and is currently running around with his normal costume. Nightwing sent Wally and Hal to break into one of Waller's facilities and steal some data. So Hal makes a pit stop at an island owned by Bruce Wayne. Apparently, Hal and Bruce had been working together on building the fastest, most advanced bat plane ever, but the project was abandoned because the plane keeps exploding whenever you fly it too fast. That was never a safety issue before because Hal wore his ring when testing it, something that I assume Batman forced him to do since Hal typically never wears his ring when he flies a plane. Anyway, Hal straps himself into this death trap and they race over to Washington DC, where he gets pretty annoyed at the fact that Bruce didn't install any conventional weapons. The fact that Batman didn't want to use guns and bombs really shouldn't be that surprising, but Hal doesn't really know what to do with specialty weapons like smoke missiles and sonic drones, so he just drops a Batmobile on the building. <laughs> It starts driving around inside the facility, doing donuts while firing EMP bolts everywhere, and this is more than enough cover for the Flash to get in and retrieve the data. That's when an emergency security measure is activated. Major force explodes into the room, covered in some kind of Brainiac mind control device. Hal draws his fire so Wally can escape, but there isn't much he can do against an opponent like this with the tools at his disposal. Wally is in the clear, so Hal tries to escape, but remember that this particular bat plane can't be pushed very hard or it explodes, so Hal can't actually outrun Major Force, who catches up with the plane and is about to land a decisive blow that'll probably kill Hal. When Jade Stone saves him. Alan Scott managed to make a persuasive enough argument to convince Jade Stone that choosing to become a force for good can give meaning to your own existence, while choosing a path of constant destruction will ultimately lead to your own destruction. This made sense to Jade Stone, so when Waller called for a unit to back up Major Force, Jade Stone chose to help Hal Jordan instead. The Batplane explodes, and I'm kinda surprised that it wasn't used as a bomb to blow up Major Force, but seeing Jade Stone take him out so easily was pretty satisfying. Unfortunately, Hal can't appreciate it since he's falling to his doom. Apparently installing parachutes wasn't a priority for Bruce, since his test pilot was always wearing a fully charged power ring. But Hal still has a chance. He's actually right above the cave leading to the central battery, so maybe he can recharge his ring before he hits the ground. But it's not working, he's falling too fast, and the moment that surprised me the most in this issue is when Hal seemed to accept that it was over. This is actually the second time in four issues that Hal genuinely thought he was about to die, and seems to have accepted it. Maybe it's just part of the mindset you need to have when you work as a test pilot. Maybe some part of Hal has always been expecting this to happen because of what happened to his dad. Either way, it's a sobering reminder of what can happen each and every time Hal does something dangerous, and kind of puts his relationship with fear into clearer perspective. But Hal is saved by everybody's new best friend Jade Stone, who seems to be able to commune with the technology in the central battery and agrees to become its protector as Hal finally recharges his ring. Meanwhile, Carol Ferris has been searching for stray heroes who she can bring back to the JSA, and she finally finds one. Dove is pulling a family out of a car crash while an angry mob is throwing bottles at her head. Amanda Waller's deepfake smear campaign against superheroes has been working pretty well, to the point that I wonder how they're actually going to deal with this situation once absolute power is over. I was surprised to see Carol break her cover, but I guess she kind of had to if she wanted to recruit Dove. Carol is trying her best to act like a hero, but she's unsure of herself. Every time she talks, she hesitates and tries to figure out what she's supposed to say. Dove is just happy to see someone who isn't part of an angry mob, and the two fly off together. I find it very interesting that, of all the heroes Carol could have found, Jeremy Adams chose Dove. 
Don Granger, aka Dove, makes a fairly suspicious mention of having not been around for a while. Then, when Carol tells her that they're going to the Tower of Fate, Dawn immediately refuses to go. As she starts to freak out, Dawn says that the Lords of Chaos and Order have gone quiet, and something apparently happened to Hawk, who I'm assuming is still Hank Hall, unless maybe Holly came back to life. I also wonder if Dove's aversion to the Tower of Fate has anything to do with the fact that she and Hank are the parents of Hector Hall, a former Doctor Fate. Actually, it's more complicated than that, because I think Hector was originally Hawkman and Hawkgirl's son, but then he died and was reincarnated as Hawk and Dove's son, and then became Dr. Fate. I'll be honest, I don't remember if I've even seen Hawk and Dove since the New 52. I tried looking up more recent appearances, but couldn't find anything. If anyone out there is a fan of Hawk and Dove, let me know in the comments what's been going on with them recently. If the answer is nothing, then that means there is a lot of potential for what Jeremy Adams could do with them in the long run. Especially since Dove's ability to channel the white light of the emotional spectrum was never explained as far as I know. Dove is freaking out because Nathan, the Sorrow Lantern, has found Carol. The steady stream of smoke that was leaking out of his ring two issues ago has grown into a billowing fog that blocks out the light, engulfing everyone in grey despair. Now, I promise I'm not trying to make fun of this, but the first thing I thought of when I saw this page was the rain cloud that follows around Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Nathan apparently has the ability to inflict sorrow on other people, amplifying their existing feelings to the point that it overwhelms them. There's a great visual touch, where Dawn's normal, clean white word balloons start to turn darker and more shaky until they're eventually fully distorted by sorrow. The fundamental difference between Nathan and Carol in this moment is that Nathan believes the heartbreak and sorrow Carol experienced because of Hal should be the end of their love, but Carol still loves Hal anyway. Nathan also seems to be applying that logic to himself. He talks as though Nate is someone who's gone now, and that the tears and heartbreak caused by Carol was an ending that left behind nothing but a cloud of human misery. Also, it's not lost on me that Nathan, the Sorrow Lantern, the villain of this scene who's given up on love and life, is the one character in this book who's saying everything I've been saying about Hal and Carol's relationship since this series began. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not idealistic enough to navigate a world where true love always finds a way. If there's one thing we should have all learned from Green Lantern by now, it's that emotions are powerful and should never be underestimated. That doesn't mean I suddenly feel differently about the way Hal's been acting, but I do think it matters that we're getting more of Carol's perspective now that the narrative is focusing on what she's going to do with her life going forward. Up until recently, we've only really been seeing things from Hal's point of view, and Carol was a supporting character who appeared sporadically. Now she's becoming more of a main character, with more agency, and we're getting inside her head more often. Who knows, maybe Carol will convince me that I've been too hard on Hal all along. Carol's love for Hal is enough to disperse Nathan's cloud, and he can actually mold it into constructs, which looks really cool. But he's ultimately failed to inflict Carol with sorrow, so he flies away, promising that no one will ever feel love again once he's done showing the world that sorrow is the only truth. And I just want to say, for someone who's so unsure of herself when it comes to doing this whole superhero thing, her instincts and heart are perfect for it. Because she showed up with a friendly smile on her face, and the very first thing she did when Nathan appeared in front of her, brandishing a strange and unknown power, was to try and save him. Since the emotional spectrum is clearly more screwed up than she thought, and Dove has no interest in going to the Tower of Fate, Carol leaves to go find Hal. Thanks to the love that connects them, Carol is able to fly right to the hiding place of the central battery. She tells him that after spending time with the JSA, she has a new perspective on what Hal does with his life, and on what she might be able to do with her own. Hal and Carol fly off to save the world together, leaving Jade Stone to guard the central battery, and look at him with his big dumb sword! That's the best! The fact that they suddenly gave the battery such a powerful protector makes me think it's going to need protecting from something pretty soon. Then we get something I didn't expect. The entire creative team of Green Lantern War Journal came back to give the series an epilogue, 
which is actually very appropriate since War Journal started as backups in the first three issues of this series. Green Lantern War Journal Epilogue The Family Business is written by Philip Kennedy Johnson with art by Montos, colors by Adriano Lucas, and letters by Dave Sharp. John and Ellie are at Steelworks, helping to complete the construction on the very same prototype train that John was helping Steel to design during his job interview way back in War Journal number 2. John's even wearing the same clothes that he had on in that issue, so this really feels like the series came full circle. John Stewart confides in John Henry Irons that, while he's thrilled to have his family back, he isn't sure how to handle them being a part of the more dangerous aspects of his life. His mother Shirley and his sister Ellie Rose both exist as an extension of his ring and his will, so there is no leaving them at home where they can be safe. Steel had to go through something similar with his daughter, Natasha, who carries on the Steel legacy. And he actually takes comfort in the fact that it was totally out of his control. He looks at his daughter being a hero and understands that she would have ended up here no matter what, so it's better to just trust her. But one thing he doesn't trust is the fact that John still has the Dark Star Ring, which contains the power of an old god. And he notes that Superman's adventures on War World ended with him returning to Earth with a child who was infused with the power of that same old god. Steel is convinced that something big is coming, but at the same time, they both have very good reason to believe that the future is in good hands. Now next time, before we get to Green Lantern number 16, we've got a one-shot called the Green Lantern Civil Corps Special. It's being written by both Jeremy Adams and Philip Kennedy Johnson, and is going to involve characters from both this book and War Journal. And, I don't know, maybe I'm making something out of nothing, but I get the feeling this is gonna be the start of something big. Like, both Lantern books have been leading up to this moment. It also doesn't hurt that the Sinestro Corps War storyline during the Jeff Johns run started the same way. More than a year of build-up across two Lantern books, a flashy start and a one-shot with the word special in the title. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe our minds are about to be blown. We'll see very soon. So that's issue number 15. Now I want to know what you think. Did you enjoy Absolute Power? Do you like the way Jade Stone's storyline turned out? What's going on with Dove? Tell me all about it in the comment section down below, and subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot of good stuff coming to this channel very soon, including the continuation of this storyline. So let me just say thank you for taking the time to watch. My name is Dan, we'll talk again soon.